Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. Welcome back to Talking Tudors, episode 149. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and I'm so glad that you could join me. Before we begin, I'd like to share with you some very exciting news. Today is the launch of 365 Days with Anne Boleyn, an intimate journey of discovery. This unique and immersive learning experience is much more than just an online course about the life and times of Anne Boleyn. Over 12 months, from January to December 2023, Participants will come together and contribute to a supportive and inspiring online community of individuals who will share in a unique learning experience, one that will ultimately bring them closer than ever to the woman behind the famous Pearlby necklace. Each month, participants will have access to, among other things, several pre-recorded lectures, live discussions and virtual tours presented by myself and other guest contributors, including Dr. Owen Emerson. The details are outlined in the blog post published on my website on the Tudor Trail. Numbers will be strictly limited to ensure a personalized experience. If you're interested in joining me on this journey, please let me know as soon as possible. Prepare to be well and truly spoiled. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com or click on the Be A Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. March's prize is a copy of The Carnival of Ash by John Beckerleg. Thank you to Rebellion Publishing for sponsoring this great prize. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. At the end of the month, I'll be chatting to Dr. Owen Emerson about a new exhibition opening at Hever Castle today, entitled Becoming Anne, Connections Culture Court. Please get in touch with me if you'd like to register for this event. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks, and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtutors.threadless.com. I would love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tutors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag ILoveTalkingTutors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about Anne Boleyn's first recorded appearance at Henry VIII's court, which happened to have taken place on this day 500 years ago, is Dr. Owen Emerson. Dr. Emerson is a social and cultural historian, currently working as castle historian and assistant curator at the stunning Hever Castle in Kent, Anne Boleyn's childhood home. He completed his doctoral research at the University of Sussex. Owen's first book, co-authored with the historian Claire Ridgway, is entitled The Boleyns of Hever Castle. His second book, co-authored with the historian Kate McCaffrey, is entitled Becoming Anne, Connections Culture Court, and accompanies the exhibition that opens today at Hever Castle. It will be published on the 4th of March 2022. My conversation with Owen is coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of singer-songwriter Carleen. The song Born to Be Your Queen is from the Ballad of Anne Boleyn, Carleen's best-selling album inspired by the life of Henry VIII's second queen consort, Anne Boleyn. Mm 
Make me your wife, your one and only. I'll give you everything you need. I'll give you suns, I'll give you glory. For I was born to be your queen. When they refuse and they oppose you, remember God is in your ear. You are the king and you must have and true that I was born to be your queen. Welcome back to Talking Tudors, Owen. How are you? I'm very good, thank you, Natalie. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm always good when I get to chat with you. It's always a pleasure. So, (laughs) Owen, since the last time you were on the show, we've actually had a lot of new listeners find us, which is fantastic. So could you please just introduce yourself to our listeners and just tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a social and cultural historian. I'm really fortunate to be working as a castle historian and assistant curator at Hever Castle, Anne Boleyn's childhood home. Uh, I've contributed to a number of documentaries on the Tudor era, including The Boleyn's A Scandalous Family on the BBC and Channel 5's Lady Rochford. I co-authored my first book, Uh, The Berlins of Hever Castle with historian Claire Bridgeway last year. And my second book is co-authored with historian Kate McCaffrey, uh, who's also an assistant curator at Hever. And it's entitled Becoming Anne Connections Culture Court. And it accompanies Hever's latest exhibition of the same name, both of which launch today, celebrating 500 years since Anne's first recorded event at Henry's Court. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to get my hands on that book. Is that going to be available kind of worldwide or how do we get that? Yeah, you'll certainly be able to get it through the Heva online shop. And it's sort of a, a, an accompanying book to the exhibition. So um, it's got some lovely, lovely images in there as well. Fantastic. And that is wonderful timing because we are, in fact, today going to be chatting about Anne Boleyn's first recorded public appearance at Henry VIII's court. So it's all brilliant. That took place at a pageant known as the Chateau Vert Pageant on the 4th of March, 1522. So today's the anniversary. 
But before we look at that in detail, could you tell us a little bit about, just set the scene and tell us what was happening at that time for Anne. She'd only recently returned from the French court where she'd been residing and working for the last seven years. So what was the young Anne like and why had she been recalled from the French court? That's such a great question, Natalie. And to be honest, a somewhat difficult one to answer because we do have very few sources that let us get to Anne before she arrives at the English court. And I do think we can look at the women, uh, the, the woman we know she emerges into at Henry's court and make some assumptions about that which came before. And that really is actually the focus of the exhibition we've just put on. So very briefly, we know that Anne is born around the date of 1501, though some historians believe her dates to be as late as 1507. That's a debate we're not going to get into at the moment, but just to inform your visitors that they're there isn't really a solid consensus. She's the daughter of Lady Elizabeth Howard, who'd been born into one of the premier noble families in England, and Thomas Boleyn, who is an incredibly skilled linguist, courtier and diplomat. Um, So she's been born into wealth and privilege because of the skills employed by really three generations of the Boleyns, uh, Geoffrey, William and her father Thomas, and also because of the incredibly advantageous marriages they make into the nobility. They're really good at doing that. So it's a Real myth that Anne is uh, nobody, you know, uh, we do see that popping up every now and again, but as Gareth Russell reminds us, Anne is definitely of the 1%. Um, She's most likely born in Norfolk at the Boleyn family seat of Blickling and then raised from 1505 at Hever Castle in Kent. Her father is a humanist. He's in a circle of progressive thinkers like Erasmus of Rotterdam, who incidentally took commissions and dedicated works to Thomas. And it's clear from Anne's later self that she had been educated as well as her brother George. Indeed, I think it's likely that all five of the Berlin children were given uh, a brilliant education, though, of course, Henry and Thomas Berlin Jr., Anne's brothers die at some point in their childhood. We know that Anne becomes fluent in French, she has some Latin, and that her brother George could also speak Italian, though he did confess later that he could neither write Italian or Latin well. So, you know, Anne and her siblings have many fine accomplishments. Anne could dance, play instruments, and both Anne and George show a real skill in the art of poetry and crucially are both fully conversant in the art of courtly love. That's a really highly performative yet significant language of chivalry which permeates through the Henrican court. And Anne has somewhat been singled out by her father Thomas, perhaps because she excels in uh, the education arena and is granted a really coveted place as uh, a feed on her at the court of Margaret of Austria, who's governing the Low Countries in the Netherlands. Um, so Anne spends a year at Margaret's court, uh, which is described as a princely school of centre of high culture. She's educated amongst uh, and alongside the Habsburg royalty and exposed to a wealth of culture. And crucially, she learns to perfect her French, which stands her in incredibly good stead for her next adventure in 1514 to France. Now, Anne is initially placed in France to serve Mary, Henry VIII's sister, who had married King Louis XII of France. But after their brief union ended, and remained in France to serve the new Queen Claude, who married King Francis I. And I think Anne completely absorbs the Renaissance spirit during her seven years in France. And she is later described as easily mistaken for a French woman. And I think she really becomes sort of the quintessence of the Renaissance style that Henry VIII is striving to engender at his own court in England. Now, you mentioned that she is recalled to England and... It's actually on the basis that she is to be married to James Butler, her cousin, to settle uh, a dispute between her father Thomas and his relative Piers Butler, who are both battling for the earldom of Ormond, of which they are both claimants. However, there is another reason for Anne's recall, and I anticipate that we will cover that in your next question. Wow, excellent. That was such a fantastic summary. And you're talking, and I'm thinking that George and Anne, they're they're cut from the same cloth, aren't they? They're they're quite formidable. They're brilliant. There's lots of extraordinary people around, but they, they do stand out, don't they? They really do. And, you know, I I kind of regret that our focus is always on George and Anne, but that is where the preponderance of sources takes us. We do have one letter 
of Mary Boleyn uh, in her own hand. And what I will say is that it, it demonstrates that she not only is thoroughly a Boleyn, but also that she definitely was exposed to the same kind of opportunities that her uh, siblings were. Uh, so she is incredibly uh, eloquent in this letter. We just don't have this body of praise that the other two mm. uh, receive. So I, I would imagine that Mary was uh, given every opportunity, uh, certainly in England, uh, that George and Anne had been afforded. But you're right, they are sort of glittering uh, yes. uh, you know, examples of what a, you know, a progressive education could achieve. And, you know, George is lauded as one of the most skilled poets of the age. Tragically, we don't have a definitive work by him, but, you know, his contemporaries compared him to the, the, the best at court. So, yes, I mean, it must have been quite intoxicating to be in their presence and um, maybe intimidating too yes I was just going to say we, we, you know I'm not going to view too much from the subject of the talk but you can see how that could grate on people as well that combination of the two of them together oh yes definitely so definitely so now Owen I like to put sort of events into context I think sometimes we we take things out of context and things become confused so what was going on this is 15 March 1522 what's going on with King Henry VIII's life at this point in time this is a really great question and Anne is arriving on the scene at Henry's court at a time of flux Um, The alliance between England and France is on the wane, and a new alliance with Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, is on the horizon. So in 1520, if we go back a a tiny amount, all of the Boleyns, most likely including Anne in Queen Claude's train, had attended the sort of monumental field of cloth of gold celebrations at Guine in France, which was a summit that celebrated the promise of universal peace between England and France. This had This summit had most likely been proposed by Thomas Boleyn and was then being masterminded by Cardinal Wolsey. However, that promise of universal peace between England and France, which the field of cloth and of gold intended to signify proved to be a particularly empty pledge on Henry VIII's part. I mean, while the preparations for the summit were underway, Henry had been secret talks with Charles, and Henry actually journeys from Green to meet Charles at the conclusion of the celebrations. So Anne's own position at the French court ends abruptly at the end of 1521 when she is recalled to England. And I would suggest that it was far more to do with her safety at this point than it was to do with the aforementioned marriage proposal and actually her departure almost causes a diplomatic incident so she has this sudden departure and Francis I actually questions if the absence of the daughter of Mr Boulin that's Thomas and Anne was illustrative of the the growing entente between Henry VIII and Francis's adversary Charles and to assuage Francis's concerns Wolsey answered um, that it was he that had recalled Anne and uh, mentions that the fact that she is going to be married into Ireland to James Butler. So yes, this is a this is a really sort of rocky period, mm. shall we say, that Anne is you know leaving the Valois court and coming back to England, um, particularly because a joint attack upon France is being negotiated, as were marriage talks between Charles and uh, Henry's daughter, the Princess Mary, and Catherine of Aragon. And it might not be as publicly known at this point also that Anne's arriving at the court, but it's probably important to note here that the devoted and formidable Queen Catherine has already had her last child, uh, tragically stillborn in 1518. So yes, things are rocky, and it it is this moment uh, of change that that Anne is entering onto the scene. I don't want to read the story backwards because I always come by when people do that. However, it does feel as though this is a little bit of a threshold here and, you know, quite an important time. So we've got a sort of idea of the scene, you know, we we can picture what's happening. Let's get into the actual event, Owen. So where does this pageant take place and who's organised it? Sure. So the pageant takes place at York Place. Uh, That's Cardinal Wolsey's residence and he's hosting the Shrovetide celebration 
celebrations, really to sort of honour the imperial ambassadors who are present to continue the negotiations for the aforementioned new alliance. Now, what is York Place? Well, Hampton Court is far more famous. That's Wolsey's palace, shall we say, where he would entertain the king and court. That was his pleasure palace. By contrast, York Place was Wolsey's townhouse and the place he conducted his business. And it was a tied house that came uh, with the Archbishopric of York. Now, it does feature some accommodation, but in terms of lodgings, there is one set for one person, and that is Wolsey. So, in essence, this is where Wolsey conducted the business of the country and where he entertained ambassadors and envoys. And it's also, you know, a really convenient short ride for him to Westminster. So it it is a natural base. So just to briefly explain the celebrations as well, rather like Christmas at the time, uh, we have a blending of pagan traditions with Christian ones. And Shrovetide is sort of a carnivalesque period before the more sober period of Lent, which is defined by restraint and fasting. And the theme for the Shrovetide celebrations of 1522 was unrequited love. And there were jousts in which the king and people like Charles Brandon, Henry Courtney and Nicholas Carew ran in the lists sporting rather soppy mottos like my heart is bound and my heart is broken and the culmination of these festivities came on Tuesday the 4th of March with a Burgundian pageant themed around the assault on the Chateau Vert and it's here 500 years ago today that we first have a record of Anne Boleyn at Henry VIII's court. Fantastic. And imagining that we were one of the very privileged guests invited to take part in this pageant, or not to take part, but to witness the pageant, can you describe the scene for us? What would we have seen as we kind of come into the chamber or the room where it's being performed? Do you know, I think if I had to choose an event of the past to view, and I had a time machine, of course, (laughs) this would be a definite candidate. Not because, not just because Anne was there and this was her debut if you like because but because it does sound ridiculously lavish and at times really rather mad the chronicler edward hall made a detailed account of the revelries of this pageant giving us a really vivid image of the spectacle and he notes that in the evening after a supper Cardinal Wolsey had appointed Thomas Boleyn to accompany the imperial ambassadors into the great chamber of York Place. He details that the chamber is hung with arras, that's tapestry woven with golden thread, and that it also features a great cloth of estate. There were wooden branches decorating the chamber with torchettes of wax on each branch. And I can't help but picture that the candlelight must have danced across the glittering arras, and it must have made the chamber shimmer. The hall then describes that at the nether end of the chamber, a castle had been built. This was the Chateau Vert, uh, and this would have been a temporary fort, painted green, and it had had a principal tower which had a cresset burning on it a a burning torch and two lesser towers which were warded and embattled and the crenellations of the Chateau Vert were covered in hundreds of pieces of green tin foil so it too must have gleamed one of the towers featured a banner with three broken red hearts another featured a banner with a lady's hand gripping a man's heart and a third showed a woman and turning a man's heart upside down. So we are, again, very much in this uh, same theme here. So this is a really rather spectacular setting for Anne Boleyn to emerge on the sea. And she is honoured with a principal role in the pageant itself. And I imagine having spent time at Margaret of Austria's court and at the French court, that this is not new to Anne. She is accustomed, I suppose, to these kinds of performances and these theatrics. Absolutely. I mean, she has become fully conversant in this art. We know that her mother, uh, Elizabeth Boleyn, was first in service to Queen Elizabeth of York and then was in the service of Queen Catherine of Aragon. So her mother is also fully conversant in this language. Henry loves to uh, have these kinds of pageants. They're sort of the heartbeat of the, the ongoing entertainment at court. And uh, and Thomas Boleyn has has long been jousting with the king. So, the, yes. you know, the, they, they are at the centre of Henry's 
social and cultural world. And Anne here is demonstrating that she too can uh, partake and perform. Absolutely. All right, fantastic. So talk us through the actual performance. What happened? So the performance itself commenced with great gunfire coming outside the chamber. And eight ladies of the court were honoured with roles in the pageant, each of whom are given the roles of virtues, of I suppose the perfect mistress of the chivalric tradition. Uh, the roles were beauty, honour, mercy, pity, bounty, constancy, kindness and perseverance. And each of the virtues were dressed in white satin with their virtue roles picked out in yellow and upon their heads each wore a Milan bonnet. Now, the virtues are kept prisoner shall we say in the green castle in the chateau vert and they are warded by the vices below uh, who were danger disdain jealousy scorn unkindness malbouche and offhandedness so these are the opposite virtues shall we say that, that are warding the, the castle and these parts weren't actually played by women. They were played by choristers of the Chapel Royal dressed up as women, which was entirely uh, conventional at the time. Now, opposite the women were eight gentlemen who were similarly cast as the virtues of the ideal male courtier. Amorousness, nobleness, attendance, youth, pleasure, loyalty, gentleness and liberty. And Henry VIII obviously plays the lead role. Uh, was he ever anything but? Exactly. Um, <laughs> so the, the charge of the men was then made to liberate the eight virtues from vice and the weapons brandished by the men were fruits um, so <laughs> dates and oranges and the women replied by tossing sweetmeats and rose water so at the culmination of the siege the women are liberated from Chateau Vert and begun, begin to dance after which their masks are finally removed you can just picture it can't you and the revelries are then followed by a costly banquet called Course. This must have been a, a wonder to behold, you know. It's a language that I think we would still understand, actually. It has all the tenets of our own understanding, perhaps, of romance and, you know, the structure of society, shall we say. But it might have looked at slightly odd way of going about it. Well, it sounds incredible. I would absolutely give anything to to have been a little fly on the wall that day. And I always, yes. it just amazes me, Owen, it absolutely amazes me that, of course, Anne plays the role of perseverance. Does that not oh, I know. just... <laughs> Is that not mind boggling given what, well, again, here I'm reading a little bit backwards, but given what's to come and, and Mary Boleyn is there too, isn't she? And she's kindness. Is that not incredible? It's really quite eerie. And I think we have some really interesting and key characters uh, present and performing. Now, we don't know the names of all of the performers, but we do know that Mary, Queen of France, the King's sister, is playing the role of beauty. And I think we can say from the many contemporary accounts that praise her beauty, her fair hair and light grey eyes, that this was a really rather apt virtue for Mary Tudor to be playing too. The Duchess of Devonshire plays the virtue of honour. And of course, she goes on to absolutely stand by her woman, Catherine. Uh, and you could say that that was uh, an honourable thing to do. I certainly think so. We have Jane Parker present, soon to be a Boleyn. She will go on to marry George. And she plays the role of Constancy. And actually, contrary to her re awful reputation, being portrayed as the Boleyn betrayer, I think the works of Julia Fox and Charlie Fenton most recently have demonstrated that this too was a really rather apt appointment. And I think her life could well be defined as being incredibly loyal. As you mentioned, Mary Boleyn is present she plays the role of kindness which again I think is very apt and you are absolutely right Anne is here playing perseverance and I mean can you think of a more appropriate appointment for Anne in this role it feels like it's 
sort of written in the stars almost. And Ives famously calls the casting of Anne and Mary as an act of historic appropriateness, which I think is hard to argue with. Amazing. And is there, do you think there's anything strange about the fact that Catherine is not playing any role here? That's a really good question, isn't it? You know, is is this, you know, something that is, is put on to entertain her as well? You know, because of this uh, alliance being so important, I, yeah, I would imagine, absolutely. to her. Her. You know, is she also one of the, the honoured guests? Maybe she is more in the entertaining role, shall we say. Absolutely. Uh, the, and as you more, say that, I picture person. her there with the ambassador yes, having a discussion. Exactly. So that makes that actually makes perfect sense. So, of course, if yes. any anyone listening has watched The Tudors, <laughs> then you know <laughs> that there's this is an, an amazing scene in the show. And it, there's a moment where, of course, Henry and Anne look at each other and it's this kind of very passionate gaze. Is there any evidence to suggest that Anne made any impression on the king that day. Do you know, I wish we could say this is where it all began because wouldn't that be wonderful? And of course, as you say, many movies and TV shows have this either as the moment that Henry first sets eyes on Anne or the moment where he falls madly in love with her. But that just isn't the case, I'm afraid. And indeed, we've got another four years until we can say for sure that Henry is falling in love with Anne Boleyn. And moreover, it's very likely that Anne encountered Henry in 1520 at the Field of Cloth of Gold celebrations, and even more so that his passion for her was much slower than the silver screen generally allows for. I think what we can say is that although we can't be sure that this is Anne's first appearance in court, and it can't be because she's been given this very auspicious role in the um, pageant, so she's she's been there for some time. What we can say is that as her debut, as her first record, it is a sort of dav- dazzling evocation of the many cultural and educational advantages that have been afforded to her and which she excelled in. She really is excelling in the art of courtly love and her position and her future is looking really rather promising, I would say, at this moment. Not anything, uh, I don't think we have a hint here of what is to come uh, and where Anne eventually will end up. But it's not a bad start, is it? No, absolutely not. And I'm just thinking with eight ladies at this point and we have two Berlins, that is yes. very telling, isn't it? It does sort of suggest that the Berlins are incredibly favoured at this point. They really are. And I, I think... You know, we have to look at um, Lauren Mackay's wonderful study to really understand that Henry really does favour Thomas. I mean, it's quite likely, actually, that uh, as a young as a young boy and and, and as a young king, that Henry VIII really looked up to Thomas Boleyn. He was that bit older, and uh, but he again, he's he's the he's the perfect courtier, isn't he? He is able to to do everything that Henry loved, not not least jousting. I, I think there was a lot of reciprocity between them, and this is Henry's way of investing in the Boleyn future. So yes, we do see those early signs, don't we, of high favour for not only Thomas but his. Family. Absolutely. And let's just note that this is, of course, before, you know, Anne is anywhere near the king. So, you know, it's to Absolutely. do with Thomas and his and his skills, his incredible yes. diplomatic skills, as you said, linguist, all those sorts of things. He is favoured for his intelligence, <laughs> not yeah. for pimping his daughters out. But anyway, let's move on. Owen. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so let's talk about the location of this glittering debut because it is very fitting. It's your place, as you mentioned, but that was later translated transformed into what we later call Whitehall Palace. And why is this connection so important? It's such a wonderful and illuminating connection, isn't it? And actually, I don't think it's by coincidence that Anne becomes the first queen of Whitehall Palace, the former York Place, the residence of Wolsey. Indeed, Although no one present in that room knew it at the time, nearly all of the main characters who had experienced the turmoil that would define most of their lives were all present at that event. It's a spine-tingling sort of realisation. Many of the people present in that great chamber at York Place 500 years ago today would become key players in the story of the Boleyn family's continued rise, and in particular, the astonishing ascendancy of Anne Boleyn. One of Anne's fellow virtues, Jane Parker, who played the role of Constancy, would enter the Boleyn family in around 
1524, early 1525, when she marries Anne's brother George. Henry is heavily investing in the Boleyns. He's granted George and Jane the Manor of Grimston as an early wedding present. Henry also pays part of Jane's dowry. So we can really see that he's investing in the Berlin children uh, as well as Thomas. And it has been speculated that it was at Chateau Vert that Henry VIII first turns his attention to Mary Boleyn, for at some point before his attentions turn toward Anne in around 1526, Mary becomes the king's mistress. Of course, Cardinal Wolsey, who'd hosted the pageant at York Place, would soon go on to thwart a love affair between Anne and Henry Percy, the son and heir of the Duke of Northumberland. Now, George Cavendish, Wolsey's gentleman usher, later wrote that Anne was sent back to Hever Castle when the love match had been broken, whereat, and I utterly adore this description, she smoked or fumed in defeat. And Cavendish believed that Anne later nursed an enduring animosity toward the Cardinal. And of course, in time, Wolsey would dramatically fall from grace when he was unable to secure an annulment for the king from his marriage to Catherine of Aragon in order to make Anne his new wife and queen. I think we also have to look at the king's sister, the former Queen of France, Mary, who had played Beauty, and of course, the Duchess of Devonshire, who played Honour. Both, of course, would emerge to be amongst the most outspoken opponents of Henry's scandalous plans to marry Anne. So the scene has been set here for one of the most turbulent and shocking periods of Henry VIII's reign. And Anne Boleyn will emerge at the very epicentre of the furore. And I think we can really see the significance of what is happening in that room and what happens later. If we fast forward to the 24th of October, 1529, when we know that the royal barge rose towards York Place from the Palace of Greenwich. And of course, York Place has very recently been vacated by the disgraced Cardinal Wolsey, who had failed to resolve the great matter. He's been dismissed from the council and deprived of his chancellorship. Now, aboard that barge is King Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn, and her mother, Lady Elizabeth Boleyn, who is acting as Anne's chaperone. And this is essentially Henry and Anne arriving at Wolsey's vacated uh, York Place to inspect the former residence. And I often wonder, as Anne walks the corridors of the Cardinal's former York Place and enters that great chamber where seven years earlier she had performed at the Chateau Vert pageant, did she experience a profound sense of achievement? At how far she had risen, and perhaps even a sense of Scheudenfrauder at her triumph over Wolsey. Of course, the torches and candles of 1522, which had lit the arras and the great chamber walls, and which had caught the shimmering tinfoil on that long gone wooden castle, had all been extinguished. But it would not be long before the cannon fire and jubilant celebrations would return to that place, because uh, for Henry and Anne will remodel York Place as their palace of Whitehall, which was not only the largest royal palace in England, but one of the the largest in Europe. And Anne is at the very centre of the curation, shall we say, of that remarkable palace. Uh, it's the site where Henry and Anne choose to finally marry in January of 1533, although they had probably already married in secret in late 1522. So it's not the, you know, Anne and Henry rocking up in the barge, you know, hot on uh, Wolsey's heels as he escapes. is isn't the most uh, flattering thing I've seen Anne do. She is kind of walking on Wolsey's grave at this point. Uh, or dancing at show on it, shall we say? Yes. But I, I don't think there's any coincidence that it is this site uh, in which she decides to create her palace. Yes, and I know, and we always think of sort of Greenwich Palace was a favourite palace and it was, I think, you know, a place close to their heart, but I think there's definitely an emotional connection with Whitehall Palace and Anne. I, I think it does become one of her favourite places to be, which is so interesting when you when you hear about all the story and everything that happened there. It really is. I think it must have had uh, an emotional significance in many different ways. Some of them must have been perhaps less uh, flattering, shall we say, than, than others. Yes. 
<laughs> so fascinating. Now let's go back to the, the pageant for a moment. So interestingly, on the same day as the pageant, Henry takes part in a joust wearing a French motto that roughly translates to she has wounded my heart. So do we know who he was referring to? Or is this just a kind of general chivalric thing that he's doing? This is a really great question. And it's so very tempting to attribute this rather interesting motto to the beginning, shall we say, of Henry's relationship with Mary Boleyn. But we do have to remember that this motto is entirely in keeping with the overall theme of the pageant, which is unrequited love. And, you know, that theme really did underpin the whole of the the Shrovetide festivities. I don't think we can honestly say that we have enough information to tie this to Henry's interest in Mary. You know, we've had whole movies made about Mary's relationship with Henry. And the reality is we have absolutely or to be more precise, next to no information about it. We simply know that it happened. Indeed, our best piece of evidence comes from Henry himself, who, when asked if he'd slept with both Elizabeth Boleyn and Mary, is reputed to have replied, never with the mother, in true Henry style. Yeah, we know there is a relationship but when it started and for how long it lasted is really rather opaque. And as the wonderful historian Claire Ridgway says, it may well have been a one night stand for all we know. We just don't know. And it's a tragedy, actually, because I would love to um, get to know Mary Boleyn. I love the one surviving letter that we have. Yes. It's so passionate and it's so Boleyn that I kind of mourn in a way that we don't have more of Mary in her own words. I would love to find a little cache uh, of documents at Heaver one day, fingers crossed. But yes, it's very difficult to pin this this motto to that relationship, I'm afraid. And I love that letter. I'm a huge fan of that letter as well. And I think it shows us, apart from the fact that she's totally Berlin, um, I think it shows how difficult it was to live in the shadow of Anne and George. That must have been really challenging, I think, for Mary. Hugely frustrating. You know, it, it really must have been quite galling at times. And I often wonder, although he loved her dearly, if the same could be said for George. Mm. His, actually, his career, as short as it was, was often curtailed by his sister not by her but because of her so we can often see him acting as a glorified uh, message bearer whereas he, he should really have been abroad doing what his father did he of course he does have uh, his moment in the sun shall we say in terms of diplomacy abroad but I'd, i would i would love to see an alternative history of, of what happened to the the Berlins had Henry not done what he did and fallen crazily in love with Anne and changed everyone's life. Absolutely. And what an incredible story this was, that just the uh, the fact that it set the scene, didn't it, for an extraordinary story to unfurl. It's just been so wonderful talking about this with you. But Owen, I can't let you go just yet, so don't try and run away. I have one more thing to ask you, and that is, of course, for a Tudor takeaway. So something for our listeners to go off and explore after the show. Do you have a suggestion for us? I do. I would really like to entreat your wonderful Talking Tudor listeners to come and visit our our brand new exhibition at Heva and to find out more about what made Anne Boleyn the fascinating complex woman that she was. We've been working for a long time with our wonderful curatorial team at Heva to bring as much Berlin history uh, to Heva into this exhibition as we possibly can to show how the Berlin family achieved and provided so much opportunity for Anne and shaped her identity. We also look at the influence of the Habsburg and Valois court on Anne. And to be honest, I don't think we've ever had more Anne Boleyn to explore at Heva since she left the majestic little castle. So do please come and see us, immerse yourself in the magic and mystery of the thousand day queen to be. It'd be lovely to see you there. All right. Well, you've convinced me. So, you know, I'm booking my tickets. <laughs> How long will it be on for? Owen. Uh, so it's running from today right yep. through to uh, our Christmas celebration. So oh, wow. it will be mid uh, November that we say goodbye to the Chateau Vert. Fantastic. So we've got plenty of time. And thank you so much for coming back onto the show and talking Tudors with us. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. 
Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Music